Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, today my talk uh, is uh, an overview of the work that I have been doing in the past three years or so. Um, and so uh, the, not exactly the work, but overview of the field in which I've been working in the past three years or so, namely the field of uh, microarchitectural attacks and defense, defenses. So today I will present uh, the problems that we as a uh, research community are trying to solve, the solutions that exist uh, so far, and uh, the problem th that still stays uh, stay more or less unsolved. And uh, for me personally, the goal of this talk is to help you well, understand the headlines. So next time you hear about a new specter, new meltdown, or any other type of these attacks, you can put it into a bigger picture and maybe understand uh, which of these attacks are more uh, critical and which are maybe less uh, important. Uh, and with this, here's the roadmap for today. So in case you're wondering, the labels are hidden on purpose so that you can take it one step at a time. And we will begin with origins. So the story begins in the 1960s. It's the time when humans went into space, to the moon, and beetles crossed the street once. Meanwhile, in the computing, the computers for the first time are becoming affordable. So before the 60s and 40s, 50s, those uh, have been these huge mis machines, extremely expensive, and uh, each machine was more or less unique. So you had to train experts to program them separately for each new machine. And, uh, which is probably even more important, you have to rewrite the software stack for each new machine. Now, uh, in the 60s, uh, they become more affordable and more commonplace, especially in businesses, and uh, it's not acceptable anymore. So you don't want to rewrite everything from scratch. Uh, which, so it means that we have a requirement of higher usability from programs, and more importantly, we need a unified programming interface. So we write something for one machine and then we migrate it to other new machines uh, as uh, we want to upgrade or move to new generations. And so the pioneer in uh, this field uh, was the famous IBM System 360. Uh, so they had a lot of cool features, a lot of new ideas in this machine, but among them they introduced a separation between the interface, so how the software perceives uh, the hardware and uh, the actual hardware implementation of it. And they call this uh, abstraction, so they introduced a new abstraction, and this abstraction was called instruction set architecture, I say. So before uh, this abstraction we had software that was written more or less directly um, towards the uh, CPU, towards the hardware, and so now we can write uh, software against the abstraction, which stays more or less the same among generations, but the hardware underlying uh, implementation of it, it can change uh, independently. And uh, it was a very useful idea, it picked up, and uh, it still stays with us uh, to these days. But it also, so it was useful, but it also introduced one problem, because now we have a gap between how the software perceives the hardware and how the hardware actually executes the program. And uh, it brings us to the next stop in uh, this road, it's session artifacts. So now we fast forward to 2000s, it's a completely different world now, uh, humans are exploring Mars, we have different music in the world, and we have some financial troubles. Meanwhile, in computing, this abstraction is commonplace. Uh, you would be hard-pressed to find a CPU that does not adhere to at least one abstraction. So, for example, Intel CPUs and AMD CPUs, they adhere to x86 um, instructions and architecture. But, as I said, uh, this abstraction it introduced a gap, and so there is a discrepancy between how software perceives the hardware and how it is actually implemented. And this can be observed through so-called side channels. The side channel is a way to see how uh, the hardware behaves. Here I must make a small disclaimer, so there are actually many types of side channels, um, and none of them are even applicable to computers, to hardware, so you can uh, have side channels in like real world. Uh, here I will be talking only about side channels that are like, microarchitectural side channels for these ones. But anyway, what is a side channel? Let me give you an example. Uh, say we have we want to execute a simple instruction. We want to load some data from memory into a register. Very simple. So uh, from the abstraction point of view, from the um, instruction set architecture, or we can say uh, how software perceives this action, we just load some data into memory. So it's very simple. We just have a load there. But in practice, in the real world, in the hardware, it's way more complicated. So here you don't, it's, you obviously cannot see anything, anything here, and you don't have to understand here. You just have to see that uh, we have a very complicated and convoluted path how the data is retrieved from memory into the CPU and more importantly it's like a, a multi-stage algorithm and not all of these stages have to be executed. So for example if uh, this is the first time this load is being executed you have to re uh, 
traverse all of this path and it will take a long time to execute. If this load has been uh, executed sometime uh, before, uh, in a while, but it has been a long time, uh, there must, this data might be temporarily stored in one of the intermediate buffers and it will be somewhat faster. And uh, if um, this load has been executed very recently, then it's very, uh, this um, stale data can still be very close uh, to the CPU and the path will be much shorter and it will be executed fast. So how can we use it to launch an actual attack and steal some data? Let's take a look at the example. Uh, let's say we have some victim process and then an attacker. And the victim is, is executing this snippet of code. So we have some secret uh, that we are processing and depending on the value of this secret, uh, we read either from address 1 or 2. Uh, and we have some shared resource. So it, uh, it is some temporary buffer that is used while the data is being fetched. It doesn't matter which uh, exactly. So the first stage uh, of this attack would be for the attacker to make the state of the shared resource uniform. So they are kind of cleaning up the state. Then the attacker lets the victim run. Uh, the victim, let's say the secret is zero in this example. Uh, then the victim is executing an address 1, or rather reading the address 1. Uh, and uh, the traces of this address, so the, uh, it is, they are temporarily stored in the shared resource. So we have a change of state in, in address 1, but not in the address 2. Then the attacker, uh, well, the victim finishes running, the attacker uh, scans through the, the resource and sees that the address 1 was accessed, but not the second address. And from this, the attacker can um, conclude, knowing the code, that this is the line of code executed, and how can it be executed? It can be executed only if the secret is zero, and that's how the data gets stolen. So the attacker now knows the value of the secret. And know that in this particular example, we don't have any vulnerabilities in the code. So from the software perspective, the code is completely correct, no vulnerabilities here, but the hardware itself, it uh, uh, leaks uh, some information about it, and it enables a new vulnerability. So I intentionally called this shared resource with this generic name because um, as such, uh, many parts of this view could be used. Uh, it could be, the most com common one probably is caches, so you can use caches uh, to launch such an attack, but uh, uh, it, also, uh, it can also be a translation look aside buffers, and it could be execution ports, it could be branch predictor and many other parts of the CPU, or memory buffers, uh, but um, it's, and it's not only the core, it could be also some off-chip resources, so the load on the memory bus could be used for that, the uh, uh, values on the raw buffer and even GPU memory could be a target for such an attack. Uh, and so what's the final result? The final result of it is that one of the most fundamental uh, security abstractions that exist, isolation, is broken. Uh, we might have isolation between processes, sandboxes, uh, guests uh, in a cloud environment. It's all broken now. So for example, uh, uh, we have a browser and uh, we execute uh, two tabs within the same browser. So they would be executed in the, uh, in the same process but in different sandboxes. If we have side channels, so if they share some resource, uh, one of these tabs might spy on another. So, for example, on one of the tabs we have a banking application, and another one we are looking at, you know, cat pictures, uh, and it's malicious. So, it can steal data from your banking application this way. Uh, same goes uh, if you have two applications running on the same system. So, the isolation between processes can be broken between process and the kernel, uh, between tenants uh, in the cloud environment, and so on. So, we have the isolation is broken. So, how what we can take away from this? What is the result? Uh, what is the conclusion from this search channel attacks? Uh, from this, we can take away there are many targets for search channel attacks. So it's not only caches, it's different parts of the hardware. Um, they are present on various levels of the hardware stack. So it's not necessarily on core or on chip, it can be other parts as well. And uh, probably the most important part that uh, search channels, they break this abstraction. So we do not have uh, this uh, abstraction anymore of uh, instruction set architecture. You can look at the internals of the hardware through this channel uh, with the software. Which brings us to the next stop. The next stop being transient execution attacks. So now we fast forward to in more recent times, it's 2018, the very beginning of the year, Christmas holidays just finished, and uh, if you are a security researcher, then you will start seeing headlines popping up, like a lot of them. Uh, critical Intel flow breaks basic security for most computers. Uh, every modern processor has unfixable security flow, and more and more and more and more, more, many headlines. You got the idea. And uh, this was just the beginning because it was only a Spectre and Meltdown that has been discovered. 
And after them, we also had Foreshadow, we also had several uh, MDS attacks, uh, we had uh, LVI and some other attacks that were the authors just didn't bother writing or rather drawing all over. So what happened here? So what was the reason uh, for this avalanche of attacks? Uh, the root cause was again this abstraction being broken. So security researchers, they realized that uh, these side channels, they expose not only, uh, they not only break isolation, but also expose the internals. And here's the problem. So when this abstraction was invented in the 60s, then the microarchitecture, it was relatively simple. So, well, it is compared to modern times, to modern CPUs. And accordingly, if you had a simple abstraction, it was more or less precise and software can write uh, against this abstraction with, without any large problems. So there wasn't a lot of mismatch between the two. But nowadays, nowadays um, more than half a century later, now the uh, ISA, the abstraction, has stayed more or less the same, but the underlying implementation, it's become much more complicated these days. It's way more complicated today. And uh, accordingly, if we have a side channel that exposes this difference, then we have a trouble here. So that's more or less the root cause of it. And uh, what are the exact optimizations that allow it? Uh, there are two. There is out-of-order execution and speculative execution. Um, out-of-order execution happens uh, when we have one action that is slow, and we have uh, some other actions that are um, independent of it, but that go next, uh, so we can reorder them. To give you more of intuition of how it works in practice, I will make a demonstration. And I'm going to need an assistant here. Uh, I need a volunteer. Let's go. Come on. Come on. You need a volunteer. I was chosen? Yes. Yes. Okay. You are chosen as a volunteer. <laughs> um, yeah. So imagine that I'm a CPU and uh, I have a program to prepare a sandwich. I have four instructions. Take a slice of bread, take a slice of meat, uh, take a slice of lettuce, uh, combine them and put a slice of uh, bread on top. And uh, I'm gonna ask you to be a slow module in this process. All right. Yeah. Okay, so I'm starting to prepare the sandwich. I'm taking a slice of bread. And then the next uh, task is to put a slice of meat on top. I'm gonna ask you to open this. Well, it's closed, so I need to open it. I'm gonna ask you to do it. And it will take a long time for him to do it. So now I've blocked my... Slower. <laughs> <laughs> now I've blocked. Uh, my resources are not utilized properly and the performance is wasted. So what can we do as um, if we have out of order execution but without waiting for him to finish? What I'm doing, I'm taking a piece of lettuce, a small piece of lettuce and combining it with another slice of bread. And now when he's done, the sandwich is almost ready. I'm now we can, done. yeah. Now he's done and we quickly have a result. So that would be out of order execution. Uh, with a speculative execution, we have a situation uh, when there is one action that is that defines our next step. So there is one action where we we can we have kind of a crossroads situation. So we don't know what the next step, step will be. In this example, uh, we will have two options: either a sandwich with meat or with cheese. And uh, I will ask you to make a decision for it, but again, very slow. So again, I'm taking a slice of bread, and now which one do you want? Cheese. Slower. <laughs> uh, Let's geez. ignore that. <laughs> Much slower. Think. Right. So while he's thinking, uh, I don't know what action to perform next. Thanks. Yeah. So while he's thinking, I don't know what action to perform next. Uh, but uh, and again, my resources are not utilized, so they are wasted. And uh, to improve this situation, I'm making a prediction. I know that the previous sandwich was with meat, and I'm making a prediction that this one will also be with meat. So I'm taking a slice of meat, I'm putting, uh, yeah, taking a slice of meat, putting lettuce and bread, combining them together. And But I'm not combining them into a proper sandwich, I'm putting them aside for the time being. And uh, now when the result is known, cheese. <laughs> I know that it was a misprediction. So what I'm doing, I'm throwing away the results, uh, and uh, I'm preparing an X sandwich. But know that even though the final result is correct, so it's a sandwich which, uh, with cheese, the... I'm actually not going to prepare it. Uh, <laughs> so the final result is correct, it's a sandwich with cheese, but in the pack of meat we have one slice left. So with the side channel we know that, uh, well, there are some traces of speculative execution, they can be launched for the attack. Thank you very much.
So, uh, <laughs> that, that would make the presentation much slower. Um, yeah, anyway, uh, so that's the idea of speculative execution. Uh, to see how it works uh, in reality, in practice, uh, and, well, and uh, basically we have these two optimizations, out-of-order execution and speculative execution, and accordingly we have two types of attack, Spectre and Melda. Let's begin with Spectre. Uh, here's how it works in reality, not with sandwiches, but in real spheres. Uh, we have this snippet of code, so we have a conditional branch, and we have a few memory accesses that are being executed, and then we have some, well, we have them stored in memory. So when we execute this, uh, we, from the, so how it should behave from the software perspective, not uh, with these uh, optimizations, but how software thinks it should be executed. Uh, the software thinks that we first assign the value to x, then we execute the conditional branch, even if this conditional branch is slow, we will wait for it to resolve, uh, we will see that uh, it's actually false, uh, and then we will skip these two actions, so x is 100, but it's less than 10, so we are skipping uh, this branch, and we will finish executing. And there will be no memory accesses here. So from the software perspective, there shouldn't be any such channels here. But in practice, with a speculative execution, what happens, we again execute this line, we are blocked on a conditional branch for some reason, for some reason it's executing slow, and we are making a prediction that it will be true. So the same as with the sandwich, I'm making a prediction here. Now we are executing the snippet of code. We were not supposed to execute it, but still we are doing it. We execute it speculatively. We access something in memory. Accordingly, it leaves a certain footprint uh, in shared resources. So I didn't draw a separate block for caches here, but let's imagine that that's the footprint in cache. And more importantly, uh, we will have a second memory access, which uses the result of the first one. So we read a secret. So notice that in the first memory access, uh, we are reading from uh, object A, which is only 10 elements, but X is 100. So it's trying to access a 100th element of a 10 element object. So we have a buffer of code. Accordingly, we read in something invalid from memory, and then uh, we are using it uh, in a later memory access that is dependent on it. So here we will have secret dependent memory access, and through the exact address of it, we can retrieve the value. So for example, if uh, the secret was zero, we will access this. If it's uh, 10, we will access a different one. And through a channel, the attacker can retrieve this value and exploit this buffer. So that's the essence of spectrum. Uh, oh, yeah. And so accordingly, in uh, afterwards, when the CPU detects that uh, this was a wrong prediction, it will cancel the results. Uh, but the changes in the cache, they will stay untouched. So the attacker can still access them. It's again a to the back. And again, we have the situation where the code is completely correct. It does not have a buffer of flow in it from the software perspective, but this microtextual optimization, it exposes it and it introduces a buffer flow, a buffer of flow in a completely correct code. Uh, there are several versions of Spectre, but I won't be going deep into it. I will just mention that it can be triggered by either conditional branches, by indirect branches, by return instruction, or by conflicts uh, between loads and stores. It's not that important. At this moment. Now the second type of attacks is meltdown. Now we have a situation without order execution. Here the pattern is even simpler. We just have a read. So uh, in pseudo assembly it would be equivalent to loading from address into register. Again the same situation. From the software perspective it's a simple uh, procedure. We are just loading in from memory into register. But uh, on the hardware side uh, we have to, this address has to pass through several buffers um, so it's like a complicated path that has to be traversed and more importantly uh, this data it can be temporarily stored in one of these buffers or in many of them and uh, if there are several loads being executed then all of them will leave uh, traces and don't temporarily store data in these buffers so what happens in the meltdown uh, with the meltdown when this load falls so for example we have a page fault uh, the uh, this load is trying to access uh, an invalid address or uh, address to which it doesn't have access to. So, for example, from user space, it tries to access kernel memory. Again, from the software perspective here, nothing is supposed to happen. We just have a fault and no memory access should happen. But Intel CPUs, they uh, have such an optimization which enables well, down this optimization. It, at a fault, it will read some leftover data stored in these buffers. So, it will see that the uh, load is faulting and it will just fetch something from one of these buffers. Know that this 
leftover data, it's not necessarily related to this law. It could be some stale data from a different process using these shared resources. It could be a data from other load that has been executed previously. It's not really necessarily uh, the, the, the correct data being loaded. Uh, it can be used in several ways. One, the initial way uh, how it was used uh, is to just read the stale data. So we can leak, for example, this way, uh, kernel um, memory or rather kernel data from the user space process. Or alternatively, uh, you can inject data. So you can change, for example, the control flow of the victim like temporary uh, during this transit execution by injecting something uh, that you want into this temporary buffers and then triggering a fault. So it's like a reverse way of looking at it. There are many versions of Meltdown. You don't have to understand what's going on here. The most important thing is that there are many faults that can trigger it, so it's not necessarily a fresh fault, and there are many buffers from which this uh, data can be leaked. Um, yeah. And uh, another important thing here is that, so here you may see that there are question marks, these are places that are still not investigated or we don't have any uh, precise results. So there might be some leakages that we don't know of at the moment. Yeah, so these were Spectre and Meltdown, and these are the known transient execution attacks. Uh, the takeaway here is that uh, these optimizations, these microarchitectural complexities and optimizations, they can temporarily uh, violate the expectations that the software has of how the hardware executes it. So it might uh, violate security um, expectations. There are several uh, such optimizations, and which is probably even more important, uh, we probably don't know of all the optimizations that uh, can create such vulnerability. So there is still some things that are unknown. So that was it from the attacks. From the attacks, uh, we have sidechain attacks, and we have uh, two transient execution attacks at the moment, uh, <coughs> Spectre and Meltdown. Now we are coming to defenses. What can we do about it? Here we have several options. Uh, these are options are based on the attack requirements. So if you look at all these attacks, they have three basic requirements. In order to launch such an attack, you need to have uh, an optimization in the hardware that violates security. Uh, the second requirement would be that you need a vulnerable pattern. So some snippet of code that actually triggers this optimization. And you need a side channel to retrieve the results uh, of the vulnerability. So this um, the security has been temporarily violated by the hardware. You need side channel to retrieve the results. And accordingly, the defense strategies would be to either disable this optimization or somehow fix it, to patch the pattern so that it does not trigger it anymore, or to prevent the side channel from happening in the first place. So that there is no leakage. Yeah. And we will begin with such an isolation. So that would be our first stop in the defenses. Um, so yeah, we have this picture. Uh, such channels are exposing the microarchitecture, and the idea would be to close this exposure, to close this channel. It's a relatively mature field in the moment. It's about 20 years old, so there are quite many uh, solutions here. Uh, and so they can be broadly categorized into these six categories. Here, the top three are those that um, give us some guarantees, at least to an extent, and the lower three, most of the solutions uh, in these categories, they are more probabilistic, so you get them for cheap, but uh, the guarantees are not that uh, strict here. And we will begin with constant time programming. It's probably the most uh, commonly used technique in practice, it's uh, used in, uh, encryption, in cryptographic libraries, for example, and the idea is to change the application, so modify the application in such a way that uh, the memory accesses that happen in it, they are independent of the secrets it produces. So it's a bit of a misnomer it's, uh, here. It's not exactly constant time programming. It's more like secret independent programming. And uh, to give you an example, with this snippet of code, we would, uh, with constant time programming, we would rewrite it to something like this. So uh, we would change the program in such a way that regardless of the secret, we always access both of the addresses. And then, uh, and then we select the result from it. And then, regardless of what secret was, we will always have the same footprint uh, in the shared resource, and the attacker won't be able to retrieve any data from it. So that's the idea. There are several implementations of it. As I mentioned, uh, it is commonly used in cryptographic libraries, so that would be my manual rewriting. Uh, there, people just change the code manually. Uh, but because of that, uh, it becomes quite laborious, especially for large code bases, so um, not always practical. So only for certain applications, and 
Uh, another thing is that uh, since well, you do it manually, humans are right in box, so it's not necessarily reliable. There has been a few papers that uh, try to, uh, to do it uh, automatically uh, as a compiler boss or something like that. Um, but there the problem is that usually they introduce quite high overhead, so not exactly practical again. The next uh, option is to try to not protect the whole application, but uh, find the parts of application that actually leak data and to protect only those. Or, in other words, to rephrase it, uh, is to find out which parts of the code are not constant time and uh, to patch them. So we are trying to find a vulnerability there. Um, yeah, so here it would be like this. So we rewrote our snippet, our leaking uh, snippet of code into a constant time version and we are trying to answer the question whether it helped here. So we have, uh, there actually, it's a very well developed fear, uh, field. Uh, um, these vulnerabilities can be find, uh, found with program analysis, so you can, to, uh, can try to analyze the code of the program, for example, with symbolic execution, but as always with these techniques, uh, the testing time is very slow, so you have a problem state exploding. Recently, there been also a few papers that try to apply fuzzing uh, for this, so here the idea would be to take this snippet of code that is supposedly constant time, and run it with many different secrets, so different values of the secret, and see whether they produce the same footprint, so it means they are constant time, or different footprints, means they do have different, uh, they are not constant time. Uh, here, it's a quite effective method, but as always with fuzzing, you have false positives, and plus the setup for measurements is not as straightforward, so the results are not as reliable. Uh, the final, reliable technique here would be to partition the system. So here the idea would be just to disable sharing. So we have a shared resource, we, uh, we, have, we forbid uh, any entities that run on the system to concurrently access the same resource. So we, we forbid the attacker to access the same resource while the victim is using it. And when we are handing it over from the victim to the attacker, we first clean it up, so we flush the state of this uh, resource, and only then we hand over, then the attacker can create it. Uh, it can be implemented by, for example, partitioning uh, the resource, so we like slice it and give one part uh, to, let's say, one part to victim, one part to the attacker, and they cannot use each other parts. Uh, it could be um, by just disabling sharing, so for example, disabling hyperthreading, that's a common thing today to do, or by uh, scheduling resources in a smart way, uh, that would be core scheduling as implemented in Linux kernel these days. Um, it's a nice solution uh, from the security point of view. It gives you pretty good guarantees, but uh, the problem here the overheads because if you disable sharing, the overall performance of the system goes down. And it can, if it's one of the critical resources such as last level cache, then it goes down by a lot. So it causes huge overheads in the system level. So now let's look at less expensive techniques, but also less reliable techniques. One of them would be to inject noise. So here the idea would be. When we execute the snippet of code, we execute not uh, we access not only one address but also some other random addresses around, so that we are introducing noise in the measurements. And then the attacker is uh, will get confused and won't be able to retrieve any data from the results. Uh, the uh, noise can be ejected uh, either directly into the source; it can be injected into the measurements. So when the attacker uh, is measuring. Um, so he's trying to scan this resource, the results will be more or less non-deterministic. This is done, for example, in browsers, Firefox implements this. Or we can just ensure that the program runs for a long enough time so that it accesses many different addresses and it naturally will create noise. But the results are probabilistic because we have the following attack. The attacker, what it can do, yeah, what the attacker can do is repeat the same measurement all over again. And if the noise, if the injected noise is independent of the secret, uh, then uh, all the traces besides this address one will be random, but this one will stay persistent. So it will look like this. You see, everything else changes, but address one is uh, more or less the same. So the attacker, what it can do, it can uh, average the results and uh, read the signal through the noise. Now. Another alternative technique is to randomize the location of the, of the data. So here, every time we execute a snippet of code, we, or every time we start a program, we are shuffling the locations of this object, so of addresses 1 and 2. We are changing the location of this object. 
And here the idea is that the attacker will get confused and won't know where to look for the signal. Um, it's implemented in practice. We have ASLR even implemented on the kernel space in Linux. Uh, there is also some approaches for SGX. Uh, but this technique is vulnerable to another attack. Because as, uh, if the attacker knows a part of the secret, so let's say uh, this program is processing a packet, a network packet, and this network packet it has a standard header, which uh, which is always the same. So the attacker knows this header, a part of the message, and from this the attacker can uh, derive the address. So let's say uh, the attacker knows that for this execution the secret is zero. So it lets the victim run. The victim will access address one. And uh, the attacker will see that this is the location that has been accessed for secret zero. And now the attacker knows the address uh, of uh, well, the location of this object and well, the randomization is broken now. So the only way to deal with this uh, would be to re-randomize frequently uh, and so that the attacker cannot... So every time the attacker has a possibility to derive the location, we change the location of the data. Which Coordinate creates overhead because we have to get copy a lot of data around. Uh, yeah, um, and a reliable, probably the only reliable way to do it, completely reliable one, is to use oblivious RAM and variants of it. Uh, it's a mathematical model. I won't be going into details of how it's implemented, but it has a mathematical proof of not leaking, of in, uh, randomizing the location of data in such a way that it doesn't leak any secrets at all. Uh, but the overheads of it are extreme. It's oftentimes 100 times slower and even more. Now the final, probably the least reliable technique, but also the least intrusive one, is to monitor the execution of the program. So the feature of such an attack is that they uh, create quite a lot of noise. So the attacker has, and it's usually not just two addresses that has to be monitored, the attacker has to go through many different addresses, so each one is a memory access, and the attacker has to do it repeatedly many, many times over and over again. Uh, which accordingly creates a lot of memory traffic and also a lot of cache misses and other changes in the memory. So the victim can observe uh, how the program behaves, what is what are the parameters of the system, it will see that something wrong is going on, and probably it's an attack, and then we can terminate or do something like that. Uh, there are a few approaches to do that. We can observe these conflicts with TXS, for example, with performance counters, we can monitor the state of a memory bus, but the overall issue with this approach is that it's very prone to false positives. Because, yes, this is a typical kind of behavior. So this injection of so many uh, additional, so much additional traffic into the system is a typical behavior for a session attack. But we may also see a similar behavior when we just have a noisy tenant uh, or noisy neighbor uh, in the system. So, for example, we have two tenants running in a cloud, in a shared machine. One of them suddenly has gets a lot of traffic and we will have a lot of memory traffic as well. So, yeah, and it will be a false alarm in this case. We also had a paper, uh, so I had a paper in my dissertation as well in this topic. We used a few techniques uh, from uh, this toolbox and we targeted one uh, specific, um, one peculiar situation of SGX in place where we do not trust uh, the operating system. So the trust the execution environment, the assumption is that uh, the system can be malicious. And uh, a, notable, a notable feature here is that all of these techniques, they uh, require at least some level of interaction with the operating system. And if it's not reliable, that all of this becomes, in many cases, quite useless. So what we did, we implemented a so-called trust by verify approach. So we did ask the operating system to provide us with defenses with partitioning for some levels of cache, with the noise injection for some other resources, but we also monitor the execution of the program, and not in order to detect an attack, but rather in order to detect when the operating system did not do what we asked it to do. So that was the idea. But anyway, so what's the takeaway from this whole discussion of uh, say channel defenses? There are many uh, existing proposals for say channel defenses, and you can get uh, proper protection from say channels, but all of them are either incomplete in some sense, so they may target, for example, only caches or only certain levels of cache or some other resources, uh, or they just introduce such high overheads they, that they are impractical to use uh, well, in real applications, in real world applications. Which means that this is a not sufficient defense. We, want, we probably want to use something like that, but that would be only the first level of defense. We need a second layer. 
And this brings us to the next stop, which would be software-based security, but the one that protects against hardware attacks. This is mainly applicable to Spectre-type attacks, not Maldown, because there are, well, because of some reasons, it's basically impossible for uh, Maldown. Uh, and uh, yeah, and here we have, again, a few alternative techniques. Let's start with uh, patient deprecation. So to remind you, the idea is to change the application in such a way that it doesn't trigger these uh, optimizations anymore. So we had speculative execution, we don't want to trigger it anymore. Here we have several options. One, the simplest option to just stop uh, speculation right after uh, such an instruction. So for example, uh, Intel CPUs, they have so-called serializing instructions, opens. Um, and we can insert this instruction right after a conditional branch, and then when the CPU encounters this, instruction, it will just stop and wait for uh, the conditional branch to get resolved. An alternative technique is to delay the memory access. So we know that most of the side channels are triggered through memory accesses, but we also have other instructions in the program, obviously. We have arithmetic instructions, we have, uh, I don't know, for example, device operations and some others. So we can let those run speculatively because they, well, they can introduce some side channels, but those are very hard to exploit. So uh, the idea would be to delay only the memory accesses. And uh, the final idea would be to just get rid of uh, comparisons and not use them in the program. And uh, well, for comparisons, it, it's hard to implement, but it's applicable to other versions of spectres. For example, with the indirect branches, uh, there is so-called repolin. Uh, it's a way to replace, a condition, uh, to replace an indirect branch with a sequence of other instructions. So the um, speculation is not triggered anymore. Um, yeah, but the, so these are reliable techniques, they are stopping speculation, they are preventing the vulnerability, but the problem again is the overhead. In the worst case, for, um, for, the, mo for the first ones that, uh, for the first techniques that have been proposed with the stopping and speculation, the overheads were like five times slower than native, um, and the time new proposals have been uh, proposed, uh, they were faster but still quite slow. And uh, mind that uh, not all of these techniques are applicable to all the attacks. So in most cases, you would have to combine several of those. So some uh, cover spectre that uh, triggers conditional branches, some cover spectre that uh, is triggered by indirect branches. So you have to, you need several techniques at the same time. So you have a higher overhead because of that. We also had a paper uh, in this field uh, that's usual not bypass. Uh, that was one of the papers that proposed the idea. Well was supposed to actually propose the idea of delaying the memory accesses, but uh, in the middle of the project, Google released a technique, uh, like a full-fledged implemented technique, so we decided not to continue the project and just published an archive replica. Now, uh, the second approach would be not to protect the whole application, but only the parts that are vulnerable. So we, are, we want to find a vulnerability and only patch it. Uh, yeah, and uh, how it works? So look at these two code snippets, compare them. Uh, in, the first, well, in the right case, well, for you it would be the left, in the left case, in the left case we have memory accesses, so here, uh, we have memory accesses, and in this case we do not have memory accesses, it's just a arithmetic operation, but we have a conditional branch in both cases. So a holistic technique would instrument both uh, snippets of code, so we will have some kind of instrumentation both, because we have a conditional branch, and so we would have to pay the full price of protection here. But uh, since we do not have uh, a memory access on this side, we can conclude that it's more or less benign and we don't have to pay the price, of, uh, the performance price here. Yeah, uh, so how can we detect these vulnerabilities? We can, again, apply more or less standard techniques uh, like static analysis or symbolic execution. There have been also proposals to use taint analysis for that, but um, all of these techniques, in practice, they did not uh, show to be very effective. In our experiments, we found out that um, almost all of them, they uh, do not detect some variants or others. So there are some false, false negatives. We also had a paper here. We tried to use fuzzing uh, to detect uh, uh, these types of vulnerabilities. Um, we had good results from the perspective of false negatives, but um, we also had some false alarms. So it detected, as far as we know, all the vulnerabilities, but it also um, reported many instances that were actually not vulnerable or, well, it's arguable, but we can call them false politics as well. So there are some trade-offs here. Now, the final type of defenses against Spectre would be to 
take an existing uh, a conventional um, safety technique, for example, memory safety technique or a uh, control flow integrity technique and to upgrade it in such a way that it works co correctly also on this speculative class or transient class. Um, yeah, so here the idea would be to retrofit these techniques. Um, yeah, uh, to take this example, what we would do here, we would uh, change this memory access in such a way that before executing it, we would check whether it's valid or not. And since uh, this memory access, so this uh, A of X, it's actually invalid because the size of A only 10 elements, but we are trying to access uh, the 100th elements, this one, that would be a buffer of loop. Uh, if we use some technique that works all, also on speculative paths, we will detect that it's a buffer of loop and we will forbid access to it. Uh, but although it sounds good in theory, the problem is that actually there are no such techniques so far. Uh, there is one extension to Intel, Intel CET, Control Flow um, Enforcement Technology. It's a hardware ex extension which, uh, well, supposedly uh, it should uh, work also on transient paths, so during transient execution, mm -hmm. but it's not released so far, it's just announced, so we don't know. And uh, as of memory safety, uh, well, again, there's nothing so far, but in my opinion, it's quite promising. Anyway, uh, what are the takeaways from this second layer of defense from uh, software mitigations? They, uh, they are possible for some attacks, but not for the others. So meltdown is not covered uh, at all here, and uh, the derivatives from meltdown, they are oftentimes costly, so they are causing high overhead, and uh, yeah, and they are often attack specific, so we need a combination of several defenses. Uh, covering only Spectre 1 does not cover, defenses against Spectre 1 uh, usually doesn't cover uh, Spectre 2 and 3 and, so, and the others. Yeah, so that's the take -out. And it means that we need a final third level of defense to have a comprehensive defense, which is uh, changes in the hardware itself. So that would be the most reliable technique. Here the idea is, yes, we have this discrepancy, we are not changing the software, we are not changing the construction, we are changing the hardware itself in such a way that it behaves the way that software expects it to behave. The simplest way to do it uh, would be to just disable this feature. If you don't have a speculative execution or we don't have out further execution, you don't have problems, these, uh, these problems anymore, but the overheads, well, the hardware will become much smaller in this case. Uh, a better approach would be, it has been proposed in a few papers uh, in the past year, uh, would be to have a dedicated piece of hardware for speculative execution. So here the idea would be to have another buffer uh, on the path from memory uh, into this CPU, and this buffer will be used for speculative access. So when we are executing this line of code, uh, this uh, access speculatively, we are storing the data in this buffer, not in the caches and other structures. And when we see so if this uh, access was actually a correct prediction, then we are propagating the data into uh, non-speculative data structures or hardware structures. And uh, if it was a wrong prediction, then we just clean up the results and nothing is propagated. So it's not visible to the software. Alternatively, what could be done, uh, we could allow the speculation to go, but only to a certain extent. Uh, we might have a structure in a hardware that tracks down the uh, the data flow, so to say, and it will uh, prevent those memory accesses that can leak something. So here, for example, uh, the first memory access, uh, access in this example, it's not secret dependent, so we can allow it to happen, but the second memory access, it's secret dependent. So depending on the value of secret, we will access different parts of this object B. Uh, and we can implement uh, a machinery in hardware, so to say, uh, that will prevent this second memory access and will track this data. Uh, another technique would be to allow all this speculation, so any memory accesses during the speculative path are allowed, so we are allowing everything here to happen, both of them, but we are also tracking what changes have been done during the speculation. And when we detect a misprediction, we are cleaning up all these changes uh, in the data state, uh, in the hardware state. So we are changing, not, we are discarding not only the software visible results, but also the, um, those changes that are visible through a uh, and we also can apply all of, the, all of these techniques uh, selectively, so not to all the memory accesses, but we uh, dedicate certain pages as, uh, let's say, not speculative and apply one of these techniques there. And we will be saving secrets only in these pages, and the rest, they can enjoy the performance benefits. 
Finally, uh, instead of changing the hardware, and another more or less obvious actually uh, idea would be to change the abstraction itself, to upgrade the uh, existing abstraction, to include this transient execution. So here the idea would be to leave everything as it is, but we are extending the simple abstraction of uh, instruction set architecture to also include these uh, novel features in the hardware itself. However, it's a very young field. There are basically two papers, and one of them is not basically doesn't propose any, anything, it just uh, states the problem and states this idea, and which means that there is only one paper that actually proposes something in this field. And uh, what we can take away from the hardware defenses, uh, they are probably the solution to these issues in the long term, uh, because they remove the root cause, uh, but in a short term, term and well, in the next few years at least, uh, it's unrealistic to ex to see them in practice, that we will see them in practice, because it takes a long time to deploy them, uh, to deploy these hardware changes, especially as considerable as those that I uh, showed to you. And also maybe it's all, uh, too early to deploy them as well, because um, as I mentioned before, we don't know the complete play field at this point. So we don't know all the potential vulnerabilities in the hardware. And maybe in a year or two, uh, a new meltdown will be discovered, and uh, all these hardware defenses, they will be infected anymore. But anyway, this is the end of this road right now, and what are the conclusions? The conclusion that we can take from it is that there is a gap between the understanding of the hardware and the hardware itself. Uh, this gap, this mismatch in perception, it enables uh, certain vulnerabilities. So when the hardware behaves not the way uh, the software expected to be a new vulnerability can ex uh, appear. Out of all the defenses that I showed to you, almost none of them are completely bulletproof, so we need a combination of defenses. And we as security researchers must stay proactive, so we must uh, keep finding and searching for new vulnerabilities, because otherwise the defenses will be incomplete and uh, we might stay vulnerable. Yeah, and with this, uh, I hope that you learned something today, and uh, I want to thank you for your attention.